The Lottery, a short story by Shirley Jackson. The morning of June the twenty seventh was clear and sunny, with the fresh warmth of a full summer day. The flowers was blossoming profusely, and the grass was richly green. The people of the village began to gather in the square between the post office and the bank around ten o'clock. In some towns. There were so many people that the lottery took two days and had to be started on June the second. But in this village, where there were only about three hundred people, the whole lottery took less than two hours. So it could begin at ten o'clock in the morning and still be through in time to allow the villagers to get home for noon dinner. The children assembled first, of course. School was recently over for the summer, and the feeling of liberty sat uneasily on most of them. They tended to gather together quietly for a while before they broke into boisterous play, and their talk was still of the classroom and the teachers, of books and reprimands. Bobby Martin had already stuffed his pockets full of stones, and the other boys soon followed his example. Selecting the smoothest and roundest stones, Bobby and Harry chose, and Dicky Delacroix. The villagers pronounced this name Delacroix. Eventually, made a great pile of stones in one corner of the square and guarded it against the raid of the other boys. The girls stood aside, talking among themselves, looking over their shoulders. Had rolled in the dust or clung to the hands of their older brothers or sisters. Soon the men began to gather, surveying their own children, speaking of planting and grain, tractors and taxis. They stood together away from the pile of the stones in the corner, and their jokes were quiet, and they smiled rather than laughed. The women wearing faded house dresses. And sweater came shortly after their men folk. They greeted one another and exchanged bits of gossip as they went to join their husbands. Soon the women standing by their husbands began to call their children, and the children came reluctantly, having to be called four or five times. Bobby Martin ducked under his mother grabbing his hand and ran laughing back to the pile of the stone. His father spoke up sharply, and Bobby came quickly and took his place between his father and his oldest brother. The lottery was conducted, as were the square dances, the teen club, the Halloween program, by Mr. Summers, who had time and energy to devote to civic activities. He was a round faced. Jovial man, and he ran the coal business. And people were sorry for him because he had no children, and his wife was a scorn. When he arrived in the square carrying the black wooden box, there was a murmur of the conversation among the villagers, and he waved and called, "Little late today, folks." The postmaster, Mr. Grace, followed him, carrying a three-legged stool, and the stool was put in the center of the square. And Mr. Summers set the black box down on it. The villagers kept their distance, leaving a space between themselves and the stool. And when Mr. Summers said, "Some of you fellow want to give me a hand," There was a hesitation before two men, Mr. Martin and his oldest son Baxter, came forward to hold the box steady on the stool while Mr. Summers stirred up the papers inside it. The original paraphernalia for the lottery had been lost long ago, and the black box now resting on the stool had been put into use even before old man Warner. The oldest man in town was born. Mr. Summer spoke frequently to the villager about making a new box, but no one liked to upset even age much tradition.
as were presented by the black box. There was a story that the present box has been made with some pieces of the box that had preceded it, the one had been constructed when the first people settled down to make the village here. Every year after the lottery, Mr. Summers again talking again about a new box, but every year the subject were allowed to fade up without anything being done. The black box grew shabbier each year. By now, it was no longer completely black, but splintered badly along one side to show the original wood color, and in some places, fetch or stained. Mr. Martin and his oldest son, Baxter, held the black box securely on the stool until Mr. Summers had stirred the paper thoroughly with his hand. Because so much of the ritual had been forgotten or discarded, Mr. Summers had been successful in having slip of paper substitute for the chip of wood that had been used for generations. Chips of wood, Mr. Summers had argued, had been all very well when the village was tiny, but now that the population was more than 300 and likely to keep on growing, it was necessary to use something that would fit more easily into the black box. The night before the lottery, Mr. Summers and Mr. Grace made up the slips of paper and put them in the box, and it was then taken to the safe of Mr. Summers' corn company and locked up until Mr. Summers were ready to take it to the square the next morning. The rest of the year, the box were put away, sometime one place, sometime another. It had spent one year in the Mr. Gray barn and another year on the food in the post office, and sometime it was set on the shelf in the Martin grocery and left there. There was a great deal of fussing to be done before Mr. Summers declared the lottery open. There were the list to make up of heads of family, heads of households in each family, members of each household in each family, there was a proper swearing-in of Mr. Summers by the postmaster as the official of the lottery at one time. Some people remember there had been a recital of some sort performed by the official of the lottery. A perfunctory, tuneless chant had been read off duly each year. Some people believe that the official of the lottery used to stand just so when he said or sang it. Others believe that he was supposed to walk among the people, but years and years ago this part of the ritual had been allowed to lapse. There had been also a ritual salute, which the official of the lottery had had to use in addressing each person who came up to draw from the box, but this also had changed with the time. Until now, it was found necessary only for the official to speak to each person approaching. Mr. Summers was very good at all this. In his clean white shirts and blue jeans, with one hand wrestling carelessly on the black box, he seemed very proper and important as he talked interminably to Mr. Grace and the Martins. Just as Mr. Summers finally left off talking and turned to the assembled villagers, Mrs. Hutchinson came hurriedly along the path to the square, her sweater thrown over her shoulders, and slid into place in the back of the crowd. Glyn forgot what day it was. She said to Mrs. Delacroix, who stood next to her, and they both laughed softly. Thought my old man was out back stacking wood, Mrs. Hutchinson went on. And then I looked out the window, and the kiss was gone. And then I remember it was the 27th, and came a running. She raised her hand on her apron, and Mrs. Delacroix said, You're in time, though. They're still talking away up there. <laughs>
Mrs. Hutchinson craned her neck to see through the crowd and found her husband and children standing near the front. She tapped Mrs. Delacroix on the arm, as the farewell, and began to make her way through the crowd. The people separated good-humouredly to let her through. Two or three people said, in voices just loud enough to be heard across the crowd, "Here comes your Mrs. Hutchinson." And Bill, she made it after all. Mrs. Hutchinson reached her husband and Mr. Summers, who had been waiting, and said cheerfully, "Thought we were going to have to get on without you, Tessie." Mrs. Hutchinson said, grinning, "Wouldn't have me leave my dishes in the sink now, would you, Joe?" And soft laughter ran through the crowd as the people stood back into position after Mrs. Hutchinson's arrival. Well, now, Mr. Summers said softly, "Guess we better get started, get this over with, so." We can go back to work. Anybody in here? Dunbar. Several people said, "Dunbar, Dunbar." Mr. Summers consulted his list. Clyde Dunbar. He said, "That's right." He broke his leg, hasn't he? Who's drawing for him? Me, I guess. A woman said, and Mr. Summers turned to look at her. Wife draw for her husband. Mr. Summers said. Don't you have a grown boy to do it for you, Jenny? Although Mr. Summers and everyone else in the village knew the answer perfectly well, it was the business of the official of the lottery to ask such question formally. Mr. Summers waited with an expression of polite interest while Mrs. Dunbar answers. Her age not but sixteen yet, Mrs. Dunbar said regretfully. Yes, I got the field in for the old man this year. Right, Senior Summer said. He made a note on the list he was holding. Then he asked, "What's the boy's drawing this year?" A tall boy in the crowd raised his hand. Here, he said, "I'm drawing for my mother and me." He blinked his eyes nervously and ducked his head as several voices in the crowd said things like. Good fellow, lad, and glad to see your mother's got a man to do it. Well, Mr. Summers said, "Yes, that everyone, all men wanna make it." Here, a voice says, and Mr. Summers nodded. A sudden hush fell on the crowd as Mr. Summers cleared his throat and looked at the list. Already, he called. Now. I read the names, head of the family first, and the man come up and take a paper out of the box. Keep the paper folded in your hand, without looking at it until everyone has had a turn. Everything clear? The people had done it so many times that they had only half listened to the directions. Most of them were quiet, wetting their lips, not looking around. Then Mr. Summers raised one hand high and said, "Adam." A man disengaged himself from the crowd and came forward. "Hi, Steve," Mr. Summers said, and Mr. Adam said, "Hi, Joe." They grinned at each one another humorously and nervously. Then Mr. Adam reached into the black box and took out a folded paper. He held it firmly by one corner. As he turned and went hastily back to his place in the crowd, where he stood a little apart from his family, not looking down at his hand. Ellen, Mr. Summers said, Anderson, Bentham. Seems like there's no time at all between lottery anymore, Mrs. Delacroix said to Mrs. Gray in the back row. Seems like we got through with the last one only last week. Time sure go fast," Mrs. Gray said. "Glad, Delacroix. There goes my old man," Mrs. Delacroix said. He held her breath while her husband went forward. "Dunbar," Mr. Summers said. 
and Mrs. Denver went steadily to the box, while one of the women said, Go on, Jenny. And another said, There she goes. We're next, Mrs. Gray said. She watched while Mr. Gray came around from the side of the box, greeted Mr. Summers gravely, and selected a slip of paper from the box. By now, on through the crowd, there were men holding the small phone paper in their large hand, turning them over and over nervously. Mrs. Dunbar and her two sons stood together, Mrs. Dunbar holding the slip of paper. Herbert, Hutchinson, get up there, Bill, Mrs. Hutchinson said, and the people near her laughed. Jones, they do say. Mr. Adams said to old man Warner, who stood next to him, that over in the North Village, they're talking of giving up the lottery. Old man Warner snorted, part of crazy fool, he said. Listening to the young folk, no thing good enough for them. Next thing you know, they be wanting to go back to living in cave. Nobody work anymore. Leave it that way for a while. Used to be saying about lottery in June can't be heavy soon. First thing you know, we've all be eating stew, chickweed, and a corn. There's always been a lottery, he added petulantly. Bad enough to see young Joe Summers up there joking with everybody. Some places have already quit lotteries, Mrs. Adams said. No thing but trouble in that, old man Warner said stoutly. Pack of young fools. Martin and Bobby Martin watched his father go forward. Overdyke, Percy. I wish they hurry, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. I wish they hurry. They're almost through, her son said. You were ready to run to tell that, Mrs. Dunbar said. Mr. Summers called his own name and then stepped forward precisely and selected a slip from the box. Then he called, Warner. Seventy-seven years I've been in the lottery. Old man Warner said as he went through the crowd. Seventy-seven time. Watson, the tall boy, came awkwardly through the crowd. Someone said, don't be nervous yet. And Mr. Summers said, take your time, son. Yanini. After that, there was a long pause, a breathless pause until Mr. Summers, holding his slip of paper in the air, said, All right, fellows. For a minute, no one moved, and then all of the slip of paper were opened. Suddenly, all the women began to speak at once, saying, Who is this? Who got it? Is it the Dunbar's? Is it the Watson's? Then the voices began to say, It's Hutchinson. It's Bill. Bill Hutchinson's got it. Go to tell your father, Mrs. Dunbar said to her older son. People began to look around to see the Hutchinsons. Bill Hutchinson was standing quiet, staring down at the paper in his hand. Suddenly, Teddy Hutchinson shouted to Mr. Summers, You didn't give him time enough to take any paper he wanted. I saw you. It wasn't fair. Be a good sport, Tessie, Mrs. Delacroix called, and Mrs. Graves said, All of us took the same chance. Shut up, Tessie, Bill Hutchinson said. Well, everyone, Mr. Summers said, That was done pretty fast, and now we've got to be hurrying a little more to get done in time. He consulted his next list. Bill, he said, you draw for the Hutchinson family. You got any other households in the Hutchinsons? There's none and Eve, Mrs. Hutchinson yelled. Make them take their chance. 
daughters draw with their husband's family taxi. Mr. Summers said gently, "You know that as well as anyone else." It wasn't fair, Bessie said. I guess not, Joe. Bill Hutchinson said regretfully. My daughter grows up with her husband's family. That's only fair, and I got no other family except the kids. Then, as far as drawing for families is concerned, it's you, Mr. Summer said in explanation. And as far as drawing for household is concerned, that's you too, right? Right, Bill Hutchinson said. How many kids, Bill? Mr. Summers asked formally. Three, Bill Hutchinson said. There's Bill Jr. and Nancy and Little Dave and Tessie and me. All right then, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you got that ticket back? Mr. Graves nodded and held up the slip of paper. Put them in the box then, Mr. Summers directed. Take bills and put it in. I think we ought to start over, Mrs. Hutchinson said, as quietly as she could. I tell you, it wasn't fair. You didn't give him time enough to choose. Everybody saw that. Mr. Graves had selected the five slips and put them in the box, and he dropped all of the papers, but those onto the grounds. Where the breeze caught them and lifted them off. Listen, everybody, Mrs. Hutchinson was saying to the people around her. Ready, Bill? Mr. Summers asked, and Bill Hutchinson, with one quick glance around at his wife and children, nodded. Remember, Mr. Summers said, take the slip and keep them full until each person has taken one. Harry. You have little Dave. Mr. Brad took the hand of the little boy, who came willingly with him up to the box. Take a paper out of the box, Davy. Mr. Summers said. Davy put his hand into the box and laughed. Take just one paper, Mr. Summers said. Harry, you hold it for him. Mr. Brad took the child's hand and removed the folded paper from the tie fist. And held it while little Dave stood next to him and looked up at him wonderingly. Nancy next, Mr. Summers said. Nancy was twelve, and her school friends breathed heavily. And she went forward, switching her skirt, and took a slip daintily from the box. Bill Jr., Mr. Summers said, and Billy, his face red and his feet over large. He knocked the box over as he got a paper out. Tessy, Mr. Summers said. She hesitated for a minute, looking around defiantly, and then set her lips and went up to the box. She snatched a paper out and held it behind her. Bill, Mr. Summers said, and Bill Hutchinson reached into the box and felt around, bringing his hand out. At last, with the slip of paper in it, the crowd were quiet. A girl whispered, "I hope it's not Nancy." And the sounds of the whisper reached the edges of the crowd. It's not the way it used to be. Old man Warner said clearly, "People ain't the way they used to be." All right, Mr. Summers said, "Open the papers." Harry, you open little Dave's. Mr. Graves opened the slip of paper, and there was a general sigh through the crowd as he held it up, and everyone could see that it was blank. Nancy and Bill Jr. opened theirs at the same time, and both beamed and laughed, turning around to the crowd and holding their slip of paper above their heads. Taxi, Mr. Summers said. There was a pause, and then Mr. Summers looked at Bill Hutchinson, and Bill unfolded his paper and showed it. It was blank. It's Tessie, Mr. Summers said, and his voice was hushed. Show us her paper, Bill. Bill Hutchinson went over to his wife 
and forced the slip of paper out of her hand. It had a black spot on it. The black spot Mr. Summers had met the night before with the heavy pencil in the coal company office. Bill Hutchinson held it up, and there was a stir in the crowd. All right, folks, Mr. Summers said, let's finish quickly. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use stones. The pile of stones the boys had met earlier was ready. There were stone on the ground with the blowing scratch of paper that had come out of the box. Delacroix selected a stone so large as he had to pick it up with both hands and turn to Mrs. Dunbar. Come on, she said, hurry up. Mrs. Dunbar had small stones in both hands, and she sat gasping her breath. I can't run at all. You have to go ahead and I'll catch up with you. The children had stones already, and someone gave a little Davy Hutchinson a few pebbles. Betsy Hutchinson was in the center of a clear space by now, and she held her hands out desperately as the villager moved in on her. It isn't fair, she said. A stone hit her on the side of the head. Old man Warner was saying, Come on, come on, everyone! Steve Adam burst in front of the crowd of the villagers, with Mrs. Graver beside him. It isn't fair, it isn't right, Mrs. Hutchinson screamed, and then they were upon her.